Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new installment of our department's research seminar. Uh, this is the Department for Theoretical Philosophy at the University of Bucharest. And the research seminar is organized jointly with CELFIS, that's the Center for Logic, Philosophy, and History of Science, and ICUP, that's the Institute for Research in Humanities, both at the same university. Uh, the speaker series uh, is uh, uh, kindly and generously sponsored by WIFISCDI, that's the local public funding agency for research, via a postdoctoral grant that has the following code, uh, PN-3 Roman dash, P1 dash, 1.1 dash, BD dash, 2019 dash, 0535. And we're very grateful to our public sponsor. Uh, tonight's speaker is Bagbo Gavenko. We're delighted to have Bagbo as um, a guest. Um, I'm very excited. I've read the abstract and I'm very much looking forward to seeing what uh, he'll, he's going to share. Uh, Bagbo is uh, a postdoctoral, is a, uh, I apologize, doctoral student at Central European University. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you're working with uh, Gegeli Chibugo. And um, it's a pleasure to have you here and very much looking forward to your talk. Bagbo, please take it away. Uh, thank you. And thank you for uh, having me here and for joining at this um, very late hour in the evening. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm Barbo and as Andre said, I'm a cognitive science PhD student uh, at CU in Vienna, previously in Budapest, but Viktor Orban kicked us out. Um, so I, today I'm going to present uh, theoretical and empirical work on the cognitive architecture that allows humans to interpret external symbols in communication. And I'm happy to take clarification questions at any time during the talk. So feel free to interrupt me if I'm being unclear or if I'm going too fast. I hope you can all hear me uh, well. And if not, please, please say so, so, so that I can uh, speak up or down. Uh, okay. So my goal today is to convince you of several related ideas regarding uh, this uh, architecture, which allows us to interpret stand for relations between an external object and the ref. Uh, first, that stand for relations are defined by the link between an object symbol and an entity under discussion and not by the link between a symbol and an entity in the world. Second, I will argue that we need two representational layers to model this relation. One for objects, which I will model on Pelishkin's visual indexing theory, and one for uh, the entities under discussion, for which I will use discourse representation theory in formal semantics. In order to establish the links, the internal links between the two mental layers, I will introduce an assignment function which connects them. Uh, third, I will illustrate several depictive media to show that this system allows us to tackle a host of phenomena that may seem disparate at first glance, uh, among which puppet shows, movies, uh, animations, uh, and graphs. Uh, fourth, I will use um, previous studies on early pretend play to argue that the system develops early and reliably in human development. And finally, I will present a recent set of studies uh, from my PhD work investigating adult interpretation of uh, images. So let me start with an intuition pump that gives a very nice illustration of what this project is about. It's a fragment from a YouTube video tutorial on how to cook a beef steak. And I'm not going to talk about steaks, but I want to give you a flavor of the flexibility that humans have in using ad hoc symbols during communication. And what you'll see is a brief primer on cow biology. By a but what I really like about this particular mistake thing. is that there is a lot of this muscle right here, which is the spinalis. So this is the loin. This is like kind of like if you're looking at your back. Oh, let me, Shabu, come here. All right, so good girl. So this is the loin back here. The muscles that run along either side of um, the spine. Yeah, you like that, right? Um, and a tenderloin would be on the sort of inside of the rib cage. Um, if we're looking at a um, at beef, uh, this would be the chuck. Uh, the round back here. Brisket down here. You got a nice brisket, Chavo. Cheeks up here. Beef cheeks are delicious. All right, let's get back to that steak. All right, so what, what you just saw was, was perhaps an exotic use of a living symbol, in this case, a dog for a cow, but nevertheless, I'm pretty sure that none of you had any problems in doing this local mapping from a dog to a generic cow. 
that you are not confused about the ontological status of the dog and that you could follow the content of the demonstration and learn from it something about the world. For instance, you now more or less know which part of the cow the beef loin comes from. Um, so hopefully you are now fully convinced that this is a real psychological capacity of humans that is in need of an account. So our first question today is, how do we interpret these object symbols? And I would like to start this conversation by highlighting that there are two notions of reference, which can be thought of as orthogonal to each other. Uh, on the one hand, world reference is a relation that figures prominently in causal informational theories of representation and which holds between representational tokens and objects in the world. Um, on the other, discourse reference is an internal relation between representational tokens and objects in a universe of discourse. And for our purposes, we take the universe of discourse to consist of the individuals that are currently under discussion. Now, many external symbols fail to exhibit world reference. Consider this uh, more conventional symbol of a cow, for instance, which I'm sure you'd all recognize as such. It does not pick out any particular cow in the world. It does not make any world state more likely, yet still it is a felicitous representation of a cow. In other words, this pixel constellation here on the slide stands for a non-specific cow token. The symbol is in the world, but the referent is not. And as we want to give a unified account of symbols, regardless of the ontological status of their reference, I will de-emphasize world reference in what follows and focus on discourse reference uh, instead. Now, equipped with these observations, we are ready to delve into the cognitive architecture that allows us to interpret these stand for uh, relations. We know from the object cognition literature that humans are able to extract distinct objects from a visual scene via an indexing system that provides pointers to these objects. This mechanism allows us to individuate objects and to track them through time and space. And um, while visual features can be bound to object indexes, in other words, we can encode how the object looks like, this indexing system is limited in providing conceptual information about the objects that it represents. And while the class of things which the indexing system is prim primarily attuned to consists of 3D physical objects which preserve cohesion when moving, uh, it can be triggered by other types of input as well, such as marks on paper or pixel constellations, and indeed most, if not all, adult experiments such as the motion object tracking paradigm illustrated here, use virtual objects as stimuli. So in sum, the input to the object indexing layer is a retinal stimulation caused by a visual scene, while its output is a layer of representation which indexes the individuated objects O1 through ON in the visual scene. Um, now, beyond the ability to individuate objects, humans are also able to individuate uh, entities under discussion in a conversational discourse for discourse internal co-reference and accumulation of information about these entities as the discourse unfolds. So in, in this mini discourse, John met a dragon, he slayed it mercilessly. Once the noun phrases John and the dragon are individuated as discourse reference, we can refer to them metaphorically and update the information about them accordingly. And unlike the object indexing system, which is triggered by the immediate environment, there are no existence in the world restrictions for discourse reference as any joke, novel, or thought experiment uh, attests. So uh, in some, the discourse reference layer as conceived of in linguistics takes as its input noun phrases in a discourse or communicative situation and outputs a layer of representation D of individuated entities under discussion. To get to stand for relations between non-linguistic objects and discourse reference, we need a linking function which connects the two representational levels by providing a pointer from a visual index to a discourse reference whenever the object indexing system is recruited for interpretation. So if instead of describing John's encounter via language, we want to depict it, we can use visual objects to do so. Here the stick figure, um, a visual object stands for John, a discourse reference, and the remaining drawing, the second visual object, stands for a dragon, the second uh, discourse reference. Okay, so uh, the input to this, uh, to the assignment function, is a representation of an object that is used during communication as a symbol for something else. What the assignment function does is create a local discourse bound relation from one layer to the other by providing a pointer from the object representation to a discourse reference 
such that the visual object O stands for the entity under discussion E, as long as the discourse uh, lasts. Uh, and in order to make all this machinery work, we need one last component to account for the content of non-referring mental objects. So clearly neither the noun phrase a red dragon nor this red drawing on the right in this example refer to anything, right? So they couldn't have been caused by any object in the world. So we therefore need a function that can fill such non-referring mental objects with content. And um, note, the, uh, in, let me note in passing that this requirement goes well beyond fictional kinds such as dragon. If, for instance, I were to ask you to imagine a fair coin that we toss 10 times, the representational token you would use to keep track of it for this episode would not pick out any coin out there. Rather, you would use your coin concept to generate a new instance for this occasion. And so for these purposes, we introduce a labeling function, which is a mental process that generates conceptual descriptions from the conceptual system, which can attach to mental tokens, in particular to discourse reference. And given a concept, we can use this function to label tokens at our own discretion. Um, so again, uh, the input to the labeling function is a concept C, part of the conceptual system. Its output is a description that can attach to this cross reference. Um, to summarize the last couple of slides, just in case I, I went too fast. The architecture that uh, I have put forth consists of two representational layers, the object layer, which individuates objects, the discourse referent layer, which individuates entities under discussion, and two functions, assignment, which links the two layers, and labeling, which generates descriptions from the conceptual system, and these descriptions can then attach to the discourse referent. Um, to illustrate the full model, I'd like you to consider this short uh, Heider and Zimmel-like movie. Uh, I don't know if you um, if if you know um, these movies, but anyway, human adults, and I guess you will do that too, spontaneously describe this uh, in shape in the, the interactions between the shapes on on the screen in terms of a chasing event involving agents with goals, beliefs, and desires, and the house in which the small agents try to escape even though they know that these are not agents and that this square is not a house. Under um, the current account, a hypothetical human observer would solve this uh, task as, as follows. The triangle in the scene causes a representation of an object which points back to the triangle. This allows us to keep track of objects uh, in, in space. And the, the same uh, in the case of the big square. So this is taken care of by the object indexing system. The object representations in turn point further to the discourse referent layer, which individuates the entities uh, which are currently under discussion. In this example, an agent and a house. Now, since the agent and house do not pick out any individuals in the world, the observer needs to recruit her conceptual system to generate these descriptions, one for an agent and one for a house, which are attached to the discourse referent. And together they define two stand for relations, one holding between object one and the fictional agent, the other holding between object two and the fictional house. Um, and uh, the architecture I have presented is, is at work in very many communicative devices, which require stand for relations between objects and discourse reference during interpretation. And once these links are in place, communicators can manipulate the external object to depict events, relations, and properties of these individuals that they're currently talking about. So take a piece of narrative fiction, such as Snow White, for instance. This story would presumably require um, the audience to set up multiple discourse reference, right, to keep track of who does what to whom. And it becomes easy to see that there's a variety of ways in which external symbols, uh, visual symbols, can be added to supplement or even replace the linguistic narrative. If actors play characters and props stand for objects, we get theater and live action movies. If puppets are operated from behind the stage, we get puppet shows. And if static drawings are displayed in temporal or spatial succession, we get animations and comic books respectively. In all of these cases, mind external entities, actors, puppets, animated figures, are temporary stand-ins for the fictional characters which the story is about. And uh, moving beyond fiction, similar representational devices can be used to depict real-world rules and procedures. 
in this diagram, you have the football offside rule depicted by the position of colored circles, which stand for non-specific football players. Scientific graphs work much the same way. In this case, the legend gives the mapping from the objects to the discourse reference, and space is used to convey magnitude. And finally, memes also exploit the same structure. So this one depicts a relation between young people and ideologies via uh, um, cliched relationship dynamics. Um, and now, while the conventions for each of these subcategories need to be learned in order to become a proficient user, the basic structure underlying this variety might not be. So before concluding the first, this first part of my talk, let me turn to evidence that the two representational layers, visual indices and discourse reference, as well as assignment, the function that operates over them, become available early on in human development. Um, first, the infant object cognition literature reveals that infants can individuate and track objects spatiotemporally by their first year of life. Um, second, while the infant literature is mostly silent on this course reference so far, the basic mechanism might be available to young infants for communicative acts broadly construed, such as pointing, for instance, which um, has been interpreted in a recent account as, as uh, having exactly this function of introducing individuals to the universe uh, of discourse and to the common ground between the infant and the adult speaker. And uh, third, while the assignment and labeling functions have not been probed in infants, the available literature on young children's split and play offers uh, plenty of insight uh, into the links between object symbols and uh, discourse reference. Um, and since object substitution split and play requires these links precisely, it follows that early competence in this domain implies early emergence of the general capacity. So to illustrate, uh, typically a print and play setup involves toys and neutral objects, and an adult experimenter who stipulates pretend identities or properties on props. In this case, that the orange block stands for a carrot, whereas the yellow block stands for a banana. And then the experimenter gives children some information about them and prompts them to act on the objects or manipulates them herself according to simple scenarios. And what we have uh, learned from this uh, line of work is that by the second year of life, children choose the correct prop for different pretense actions. So for instance, if they are told that horses like carrots and gorillas like bananas, they will choose the correct prop for different pretend eating actions. Um, moreover, they can also follow simple causal transformations in pretense and refrain, for instance, from using this banana block if the gorilla ate it already, even though the block is still physically present in, in, on the table in front of them. And uh, finally, they can select pictures representing the imaginary transformations just enacted. So in one study, the experimenter pretended that the gorilla spilled red paint over, um, over the horse. And at test, children were shown these two photographs and were asked to show to the experimenter how the horse looks like now. And they point to the one on the left, so the red one, despite the perceptual similarity between the one on the right and the toy horse uh, in front of them. So this was imaginary paint, there was no paint uh, involved. Um, and so, um, so in other words, they are able to answer questions based on what is being communicated about the discourse reference, not about the physical symbols in front of them. Um, of course, it's possible that children believe that this relation between uh, an object and the discourse referent is one of identity. The orange block is a carrot, the yellow block is a banana. However, this doesn't seem to be the case as children keep make-believe identities distinct across context and speakers, so they are absolutely fine with treating the um, orange block as a bar of soap in a different pretend game, which shows that these relations are indeed local and this goes bound from the beginning. Um, so in some, what children's early pretend play shows is that they have early access to this uh, semantic relation, the stand for relation which holds between an object symbol and the discourse reference. That the relation is local to the current communicative context, since a symbol is in principle free to stand for many other things across discourses. Um, and the discourse reference, especially in pretend play, do not pick out any reference uh, in the world. So <clears throat> um, this goes to show that 
children can uh, self-generate these mental tokens from their conceptual repertoire without resorting to representations of objects in the external world. <clears throat> Now, written play illustrates another important aspect of, of these relations. So, um, until recently, there has been a large emphasis on the need to quarantine written representations. Um, originally, the psychologist Alan Leslie introduced quarantining uh, some 40 years, 35 years ago, as a way of defending the integrity of the conceptual system. So take psychologist's favorite pretend play example and suppose that the child sees their parent pretend that the banana uh, is a phone. Leslie wanted a way that can ensure that children do not come to believe that bananas are phones after seeing their adult uh, engaging in these uh, in these actions. So uh, after the child sees their parent pretend that the banana is a phone, they should not draw the conclusion that bananas are phones or that bananas can actually be, be used as phones. But there are two relations involved in pretend play. One of them is a relation between objects and discourse reference. And under this account, quarantine in Leslie's original sense might not be needed at all, since the child only needs to index a perceptually available object, which happens to be a banana, and link it to the phone discourse reference. And the relation that, that obtains between this object and the phone is a stand for relation, not an identity one. So the content banana is phone is never represented in the child's mind. Um, and last but not least, the, the relation is local, so it will be discarded at the end of the episode uh, anyway. Uh, the second relation in this structure holds between discourse reference and, and the world. So does this phone, which the banana currently stands for, exist in the world? Probably not. So, so this uh, phone token does not pick out any, any phone in the world. However, phones um, do exist in the world. So children might, might waste good learning opportunities if they simply quarantine everything indiscriminately. Uh, therefore, it, if pretense is a form of communication, quarantining the information predicated about discourse reference by means of props is precisely what we should not observe. Uh, for, in the interest of time, I will skip the empirical studies showing that children can learn effortlessly from pretense, but, uh, but we can take this up again during the Q&A. Uh, for now, you'll just have to take uh, my word for it that just as you can learn where the B flowing comes from based on uh, a demonstration on a dog, um, so, so do young children. Um, so in short, just as language can be used to talk about anything, prompts can be, can be, props can be used to depict specific events, generic states of affairs, fictional content, and so on. But this is orthogonal to setting up the stand for relation between objects and discourse reference. So we should not confuse the structure of pretense with the ontological status of what we talk about. All right. <clears throat> so um, to sum up this first part of my talk, we often use objects as symbols to convey information about individuals that are relevant to the current communicative context. This is achieved by means of a semantic relation that holds between objects in the visual indexing system and discourse reference. Um, and young children's pretend play shows that its relation is accessible and available very early on in, in, uh, in human development. Now, another question that we can ask concerns the nature of the cognitive processes that I have just described. Is, for instance, the interpretation of certain objects as symbols automatic? Um, so let, let us now turn to a set of adult experiments that we have recently conducted, showing that um, these relations and interpreting objects as symbols come indeed spontaneously and automatically and thus very naturally to human adults. Um, but before that, let me just make a very short methodological detour. So um, even though we use objects as symbols extensively in communication, uh, object perception research is typically silent on this point. So indeed, to investigate perceptual processes involved in uh, object cognition, the typical methodology involves human participants being presented with on-screen images by the researcher. And then after the results are in, generalization to ordinary real-world perception ensues while glossing over the fact that images may be interpreted communicatively. Uh, and here are some typical examples of this phenomenon. Uh, psychological responses to buildings and natural landscapes using images of exterior architecture and natural landscapes. Color-based object recognition, a database consisting of 500 images. <clears throat> 
outline shape in object recognition images again. Now, even though the stimuli are two-dimensional images presented on a screen, the conclusion of these papers are about uh, non-symbolic uh, objects, as the titles uh, attest. But is this true? Are visual processes uh, the only type of process that researchers are tapping into? Or are they inadvertently tapping into other types of processes and inferences as well? If Stanford relations are a thing, and if they are available to the adults taking part in these experiments, the responses might reflect more than just perceptual processing. So let's see if, uh, if that is indeed the case. Um, our start, starting point is a, will be a paper from two, 2012, which reported a familiar size strobe effect for object images. Uh, and just as a refresher, the original strobe effect is the phenomenon whereby uh, adults find it more difficult to state the color of a written word if the word denotes a different color from the color of its font. So adults take longer and make more errors when they have to state that this token um, is yellow as compared to, to this one. Can, can you see my mouse? Okay. Yes, we can. Uh, th thanks. Um, so <clears throat> the, the increased reaction times and the higher likelihood of uh, error indicate that there is some interference going on uh, in the participant's mind, right? So in this case, between the symbol vehicle and its meaning, making this type of stimuli more difficult to process uh, than this one. Now, the size stroop effect, which will be our case study for this part of the discussion, uh, builds on the same principle, but the interference is caused by size rather than color. So uh, in the 2012 paper, Conkel and Oliva had participants judge which of two images is smaller or larger on the screen. So it's a very easy task. You have two images, one, one of uh, which is large, larger than the other, and you just have to press a key to indicate uh, which of them is um, smaller or larger on the screen. Um, and what they found was that participants' visual size judgment is, is slowed down for displays such as the one on the right and that participants also make more errors on these displays. So the fact that clocks are smaller than horses makes the size contrast between a large clock image and the small horse image more difficult to process. Uh, in, in other words, uh, participants find those trials harder in which the size difference between the two images is incongruent with the actual size uh, of the objects depicted in the images. And it, this happens even though the interpretation of the images is completely relevant to the task. So to judge which of two images is larger, you just need to look at the surface area, just need to look at the corners and uh, identify the one which covers more space on the screen. But still, adults, however, cannot help interpreting these images, even though they don't need to. Uh, now, why does this effect uh, arise? Um, according to the original paper, uh, adults perform object detection on these images automatically. They identify the objects, even though the task doesn't require them to, and they access their prototypical real world size automatically. On incongruent trials, there's a mismatch between the size on the screen and the real, real world size of the kind to which the objects belong. And this mismatch gives rise to the Stroop effect. At, a, at an abstract level, if you will, the, the question that the cognitive system uh, addresses, according to this account, is what are these objects exemplars of? And the, but there is an alternative explanation that we are testing in this study. Uh, and um, the idea is that this is, it is not object recognition that matters here, but the fact that participants interpret these images as symbols. So if true, what participants will automatically try to figure out what, when seeing these displays is what, what these images represent. And when they make this inference, they will attach a conceptual description to the discourse reference. And it will be this description that causes the Stroop effect, not the actual size of the object, which is depicted on the screen. So in our account at the, at the same abstract level, the question that the cognitive system asks is thus not what are these object exemplars of, but what do, what do these objects stand for in this context? Um, since the two accounts make identical predictions for the original task, we needed a different class of objects to tease apart between the two hypotheses. And we realized that toy objects are great candidates to pit the two hypotheses against each other because they are small objects, but they are used as stand-ins for entities which are larger than themselves. 
so um, the question of of of, experiment, of our experiment was when participants are faced with these two displays, which way will the strobe effect go? Which of these two images will participants find harder to process? So uh, the first possibility is that the object detection system will identify these objects for what they are. That is, I'm, I'm talking now about the toy soldier, right? So the toy soldier is a smaller, typically a smaller object than a banana. But um, on the other hand, it's possible that a toy soldier is taken to, to stand for a soldier, uh, in which case, we, and soldiers are larger than bananas, right? So um, the, the, this is the, um, the, the uh, rationale uh, behind, uh, behind this experiment. So on the one hand, from previous visual experience, the object detection system will tag these objects as what they are, small objects. So then they will be slow to judge the display on the left. On the other hand, because images are symbols, participants will infer what this object stands for, and they will be slow to judge the display such as, such as this one. Um, so we gathered uh, 36 image triplets with the following structure, a large object X, a medium sized object Y, and a small symbol of the large object X. And we included uh, animals, plants, vehicles, furniture, um, and agents uh, in, in a study. And these triplets were split into two pairs across uh, two between subject conditions. So participants in the object conditions had to compare the images in the first two columns, the large X to the medium sized Y. This is exactly like the original task, but with different stimuli and participants in the symbol condition had to compare the images in the in the last two columns the small symbol of uh, x on the right to the medium sized y object in the middle um, so here is an overview of the two conditions in the object condition participants had to decide which of two images was smaller or larger on the screen and um, <clears throat> As in, as in the original task, there were congruent trials and incongruent trials here. The, there's, there's a congruent, I mean, the congruent trial uh, is congruent because trains are larger than fountains. And uh, when this size relation reverses, you get an, uh, an incongruent trial. And in the symbol condition, um, we replaced a large object with a toy version. Uh, and note that we define congruency based on the real world size of the object. So. In this case, in the symbol condition, this image on the left is a congruent trials because fountains are larger than wooden toy trains. Um, it would be great at this point if you had if you have any any questions before I move to to the results. Um, okay. So here are, here are the, the results. So to analyze this Stroop effect, we calculate individual average reaction times on incongruent trials, individual average reaction times on congruent trials and subtract the congruent average from the incongruent average. So we have one score for each participant. And if incongruent trials take longer than congruent ones, we will observe a positive Stroop effect. If on the other hand, congruent trials take longer we will observe a negative Stroop effect. And if they're equal, then uh, zero will be the average value of the effect. So uh, in, this, in this graph, uh, on the x-axis, I, I, I plot condition, whereas on the y-axis, I plot individual Stroop effects in milliseconds. That is the difference between incongruent and congruent reaction times. So as you can see, the object condition replicates the original finding, uh, which is a good sanity check. So it takes participants longer to judge uh, small train versus large fountain trials compared to large train versus small fountain trials. And in the symbol condition, on the other hand, we find the negative stroop effect. So it's in the opposite direction, meaning that it is the congruent trials which take longer to process than uh, incongruent ones. So it takes participants longer to judge small toy train versus large fountain rather than compared to large toy train versus small fountain trial, even though the former are congruent with the real world size of the object depicted in these images. 
Um, and the error rates painted a similar picture. So in the object condition, participants were more likely to err on incongruent trials, where we see the opposite pattern in the symbol condition. Um, Again, this suggests that congruent displays as defined by actual size are more difficult to process than incongruent ones, just as what we found for uh, reaction times. So to, to sum up the findings of, of this experiment, the objects depicted in the image mattered less than the animal, vehicle, agent, etc., for which the depicted object usually stands for. That is, the <clears throat> pairs in the object condition and the symbol condition are interpreted the same way. A picture of a train is taken as a symbol for an unspecified train token, and the same holds for a picture of a toy train, even though the prototypical sizes of trains and to toy trains are very different. Now, two open questions remain. Um, first, did participants mistake the toys for the large objects that the toys typically represent? And second, if they did not, uh, mistake the toys for the objects, can we nudge participants into interpreting the toy images as standing for toys? So an image of a toy train is ambiguous in terms of what it can stand for. It can stand for a train, but it can also stand for a toy. And we know from experiment one that participants can interpret the toy train image as standing for a train, but we wanted to know whether we can elicit the other possible interpretation as well. Uh, if adults treat images as symbols standing for discourse reference in a particular communicative context, then the interpretation they assign to the images should all should be context dependent. So to investigate both questions at the same time, we ran a, an experiment which was identical to experiment one, except we removed the medium sized object from the picture and compared the large objects in the object condition of experiment one to the small toy versions in the symbol condition of experiment one. So we pitted um, the large object X against the uh, toy versions of X. And the experiment had two aims. So first, we wanted to find out whether the time that participants typically take to make a judgment on a single trial is enough for them to distinguish that these are toys. And second, to check whether adults are inflexible in the conceptual description they attach to the images on the screen. So it could be that participants always output train when seeing a toy train. And this could happen for a variety of reasons, such as long-term association, for instance. Now, note that an affirmative answer to either of these questions implies no Stroop effect in this task, since two equivalent mental tokens will be compared, right? Both For both images, you'll get a train conceptual description, so then you'll get no Stroop effect because there's no inter interference going to happen. Um, However, uh, this is not what we, we found. We did find a Stroop effect, just like in experiment one. So now uh, it seems that when you pit a toy object X versus the object X, people revert to treating the small, the small toy objects as small um, and, and uh, are, um, take the discourse reference to be a toy in this case because of this contrast. So as you can see in this graph, we, the, the Stroop effect is positive. That these participants were slowed down by the trials in which the toy was larger than the object. Um, and as for error rates, uh, again, the same. So participants' average error rates in the two trial types uh, show that um, while participants are highly accurate uh, on this task, when they make an error, they are much more likely to make an error on displays such as this one. This compared to displays such as the one on the left. Um, to some of the findings of experiment two, we found that first, participants do not mistake the toys for the larger objects, or else we would have observed no effect. And second, by using contrastive displays, we elicited a different interpretation from participants in experiment two, where a toy train image was taken to stand uh, for a toy from the one in experiment one where the toy train image was taken to stand for a train. And uh, if, you, if you think about it, this is quite remarkable. Um, so the same object gives rise to two different interpretations, two different assignments, depending on the context in which it is presented, suggesting that human adults behave in a communicatively rational way. So it makes very much sense for an inferential, inferential process that asks, why am I being presented with these two images to output toy zebra? when a contrast with the real zebra is provided. Um, 
So the these uh, results I um, gave an overview of show that uh, first small symbol objects can cause a strobe effect based on the size of the large object these symbols usually stand for. And second, the results also show the direction of the that the direction of the effect is modulated by the context, as participants take the entire display into account when attach, attaching conceptual descriptions to the tokens in the discourse reference layer. And because images of objects are interpreted as symbols by default, the familiar side strobe effect is an inferential and communicative phenomenon, not an object detection one. What matters most, it seems, is not what the object is, but what it is taken to stand for. To bring everything together, um, in order to represent stand for relations in communication, uh, humans employ two representational layers. One for object indexing, the other for discourse referent individuation, and an assignment operation which maps one layer to the other. These relations are ubiquitous across many communicative devices where the object indexing system of the interlocutor is recruited for interpretation. And notably, this includes experimental settings and especially computer display stimuli. And finally, the ability to grasp these relations emerges early in human development as shown by children's um, early proficiency with object substitution pretense, which involves props that are used and manipulated in order to convey information about uh, various discourse reference and from which children can learn new information about the world, uh, just like us. And um, before ending, uh, allow me to thank um, my co-author, Gabor Brody, and my supervisor, Diego Chibra, and CEU and the European Research Council for funding these uh, chimeras. And uh, thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Bagbu. This has been uh, quite illuminating and thought provoking. We very much appreciate it. I am using my virtual applause button as uh, I see so many of our colleagues are. Um, if uh, you'd like to uh, ask some uh, questions, uh, related to Bagbu's talk, uh, this would be an ideal time to do it. So uh, please don't hesitate to raise your virtual hand or make yourself known in chat. Thanks. And we have a question from Katalin Tohagi. Katalin is a current MA student in the Mind and Brain program at, uh, in the Department of Theoretical Philosophy. Katalin, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Andre, and uh, uh, thank you, Bagbu. Great, uh, great talk today. Uh, I have a clarifying question around the architecture. So maybe you can explain a bit more uh, because I understood the, um, the object layer. I understood the Discord reference layer. Uh, if you can explain a bit more about the labeling process and where is, I mean, all this conceptual system and where is this coming from actually, if you can tell more about it, thank you. Uh, sure. Where is this? Um, what do you mean uh, by where is this coming from? I... Well, well, so if you yeah. can explain a bit more, what does it mean exactly? Because I can understand referencing to objects. I can understand discourse, but maybe I think I would like more explanation about the conceptual system and the labeling part. Yeah. Um, so. Um... I, what we I, what I have in mind is a very simple operation. Uh, I assume there are concepts, discrete uh, mental um, objects, uh, which are pointers to templates which store knowledge about um, the reference of these concepts in the world. So coins for in, for coins, for instance, I assume there is some um, uh, there is some knowledge, our knowledge about coins. Is stored and linked to the coin concept, right? So that's that's uh, what I assume. In addition, I assume that you can take any concept and generate uh, generate uh, a, a conceptual description that can attach to other mental tokens. So, in the imagine a fair coin example, uh, if I ask you to ima to imagine a a, a fair coin. Uh, that we toss 10 times. Uh, the only thing that uh, you need to do is to, to create a mental token, a, a discourse referent, that um, to, to be able to keep track of it, 
while we talk about it. And um, um, yeah, that, that, yeah that, that's um, no, it's clear. Uh, Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Catalina and Balbu, for answering. Um, Thank you. Um, next up, um, I wonder who would like to ask the next question. I'm going to, um, I see uh, Steph has raised his, raised his hand. So, Steph, please go ahead. Steph is another um, uh, master's student in the same program. So, I'm, I'm delighted this is such a success. Thank you, Andre. Uh, so, based on your uh, on the answer uh, on the answer to Catalina's questions uh, before, and uh, based on your example with the toss with the coin and tossing, do you think that humans, generally speaking, in communication or in thinking, they are representing the concept? So we we see the coin when when we do this mental experiment, we see the coin. Mm, uh, 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 if if by seeing do, you, do you, we have any representation of the coin other than the the, log, the logical concept of the coin? Uh, if you uh, so uh, okay, first I don't think we we need to see any coin like in in with the mind's eye, or I don't think there's an iconic representation of a coin or anything like that. It's just uh, a symbol that is, uh, you know, arises from uh, neurological, physical, chemical uh, operations in the brain, but it fulfills the role of the symbols in a, com in a, compu in a computation. So uh, yes, I think that when we think about the coin, there is an element that, um, that, re that represents a coin, otherwise we wouldn't be able to talk coherently about thinking about a coin this doesn't mean that this is like this has any that this resembles an image in any way um, I'm, I'm not 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 implying that but let me know i may have maybe i did not um, so you said you said uh, we do not have a representation but it is a symbol so it seems for me it seems a bit contradictory it, no, if it is a I symbol, is that, a symbol is a representation. Yeah, yeah. What I meant is that we do not have an iconic representation, uh, that we do not see a coin. When I, when I say when I say to you, I will give you two coins. There is any kind of representation in my mind or in your mind? Uh, I I hope I hope so. <laughs> Which is two. It's a quantity. Okay. But do you have any representation about coins? Representation. Or do you understand uh, my concept directly? This is the question. Do you feel the concept or do you see the concept? If I may very quickly interject something. Of course, all the time. You're all, all the time here. Uh, Steph's question. Um, Perhaps a wider background issue might concern exactly um, whether uh, the experiments that you presented uh, in your talk uh, presuppose any uh, preferred theory of concepts or whether uh, there are alternative theories of concepts that, equally, uh, that are equally suitable. And uh, the kinds of questions that Steph seemed to be raising uh, uh, seem to uh, point to difficulties that varying theories of concepts might face. And if uh, your experiments don't necessarily settle the issue between those, um, then uh, the difficulties wouldn't carry over. But uh, that's just how I thought of things. And uh, Babu, if, if there's a rejoinder, please go ahead. Um, I, they, I do not presuppose any theory of uh, like I have my personal preferences, but I don't think anything that I said hinges on um... All right, thanks so much. So um... is that is that a fact? I mean, um, 
surely you don't presuppose a single theory of concepts, but uh, isn't there some kind of ballpark that seems uh, in some ways um, uh, to, to, to mesh better with what you're saying? So for instance, um, the way I heard it, and this might be wrong, but the way I heard it, I thought that uh, the labeling uh, process was something that was picked up from uh, uh, studies about how the lexicon uh, works. Or uh, if you, uh, uh, um, it's, it's not entirely clear that uh, views of concepts uh, that uh, aren't robustly representational enough uh, would meet the demands of discourse representation theory. Um, and it wasn't clear that um, there needs to be this kind of, it, it, it wasn't clear that for instance, um, the indexing uh, would go smoothly uh, if you had a kind of two tier view, this kind of old Osherson and Smith uh, sort of version of concepts or a version on which conceptual knowledge doesn't determine which objects in the environment get picked out uh, by the pointers in question. So it seemed as though there were some kind of assumptions that were baked in concerning or the rough outline of the theory of concepts, even though they didn't sort of decide the issue. And I was wondering if you take those to be um, in any way uh, uh, sort of substantive, or if it's just a matter of course, methodologically speaking, and there's nothing there. So, um, so I, <clears throat> I think that the experiments in particular the adult experiments don't speak on that because just as you would be able to do object recognition independently of uh, the structure of the, the, the representational structure of the concepts, whether it's just uh, whether these are atoms or they are bundles of features or definitions or whatever, still there is um, these concepts are individuated partly in all of these theories in terms of um, what they what they represent. So, um, if if as long as I have a coin concept, um, it doesn't matter what that concept contains. I can just use it to um, to to you know, generate a, a description that can. Uh, attach all of these course reference. Uh, so, but then again, coming back to the adult experiments, um, there, um, I think the the um, the uh, ultimately you can view it in terms of an, a process that is identical to object recognition, but just asks a different question. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, that's really interesting. So um, lots of uh, lots of questions that, that uh, uh, the debate between uh, you and Steph uh, uh, occasions, um, but uh, I wanna make sure that uh, if there are other uh, questions as well, and we'll come back to this. Um, so I see that in chat, Kagman, uh, asks a question. Kagman, would you like to ask this Viva Voce? Yeah, that, uh, so my question was that um, could be a similar process, uh, this uh, um, in semantic interference that you describe related to colors. Uh, could it be responsible also for the delay we have when we translate uh, a text uh, from uh, a, la a language to another? What is the delay that you are talking about? The Strub effect, I, I guess. No, 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 the delay in translating from one language to another. Um, 
I see in chat that Kogman seemed to, to refer to a form of semantic interference. Uh, that, that is... is Oh, yeah, okay. when you want to translate and uh, uh, your the word doesn't come to your mind uh, easily because, uh, I don't know, something interfere, you don't have... Uh, uh, how, how to say... Um, the immediate uh, reference or... Um, like, like what, what is happening, happening right, 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 right now. <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think, I don't it's, think it's just too <laughs> Right, excellent. Um, so, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, did you mean to, to follow up on that bug? Or, uh? Uh, no, I, yeah, I guess that what happens when, I mean, what happens when translating is, uh, from one language to another is a much more complex phenomenon and to have a stroop effect, you need to have some baseline where you don't have a stroop effect. And I don't know what that mm, baseline is in, in this case. Um, but I assume that translating from one language to another is just a computational process that happens over time. So delays are to be expected. Right. So. Um... Uh, uh, thanks for that. As and, I, as I, okay, thank you. Excellent. As and Kagman, please, uh, please don't hesitate to stay with us and ask more questions in the, in chat, and I'll, I'll make sure that that you have the floor. Um, as I invite everyone else in the meeting to to ask uh, more questions, uh, uh, Bible, with your permission, I have a question of my own, uh, and. Um, it's not entirely clear to me if this concerns the specifics of um, uh, uh, your your talk tonight, or if it's a broader question. So uh, you tell me. Is this um, uh, age-old metaphysical complaint uh, uh, concerning uh, Laugi Kaktunen and Hans Kamp's early work about discourse reference? Right. Well, do they exist? Where do they exist? There are no existence presuppositions. Are there any? Uh, how are we going to uh, uh, deal with that? And um, of course, some people might not feel the sting of the question in any way, but you seem to dramatize it, I think, because you seem to be saying that, look, kids do this routinely. <laughs> this, is, this is what uh, they just, you know, if you look at, if you go to a puppet show, or if you watch a cartoon or something, you're immediately going to, in some sense, uh, hypothesize those uh, characters into a uh, discourse reference, and they're going to be importantly distinct from their concepts, right? And um, uh, no one thinks that uh, Snow White exists, or uh, no one thinks that, you know, things like that. So, um, what's up with these discourse reference? They're not uh, real, actual objects. Uh, they're not concepts, they're somehow out there. Do they have the status of just, um, um, I don't know, um, uh, characters in a novel? So you wanna relegate that to the ontology of artifacts or something. So exactly how should we deal with this in the context of your experiment? Thanks. Um, yes, uh, good question. Uh, so, um, I, I, I think, as I said uh, in the beginning of the talk, whether they exist or not, whether the, so discourse reference are mental representations. Let's, uh, let's get this out of the way. Now the question is whether these mental representations refer to things in the world or not. And I think that's an independent question. So I, I think that in some cases we talk about, um, uh, we talk about actual um, objects, or individuals who have a spatial temporal um, boundary as they move through the universe. Um, but I think, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not bothered by, by metaphysics, uh, so I can sleep, go to sleep at night and say, look, there are so many mental processes that are generative and uh, creative and uh, yeah, we have to, we have to, um, accept them <laughs> for what they are. I don't think they are mysterious in any way. 
I think that the computer, like if you open a Python program and you create a new, you have a class uh, and you create a new uh, variable that is, that belongs to the class, it's the same type of computational uh, process that's uh, operating there. And um, I, yeah, I fail to see the conundrum. Okay, wow, that's that's uh, that's exciting. So that's that's fantastic. Thanks, thanks so much for that. So uh, you fail to see the conundrum. Um, so uh, let me try to put it a different way. When you say that uh, discourse reference are um, uh, mental representations, right? So presumably, you know, I'm a kid. I watch um, Tom and Jerry. Okay, and. Um, um, I realize that this may be a kind of stand-in for the regular cat and mouse play that goes on in the real world, right? So in a sense, what the cartoon is doing is dramatizing the fact that, the fact that uh, cats chase mice. And um, yeah. Okay, and, but so um, it's clear that the cartoon could have been on even if I wasn't watching it. So um, in what sense is Tom the character a mental representation of mine or? Um... Mm, no, Tom, uh, Tom is, uh, so mental rep discourse reference in the discourse representation theory refer to, to internal representations. It's a misnomer, it doesn't, I mean, it's not, not my fault. Um, so, they are they are the mental represent the internal representations that stand for the characters, if you will. So um, yeah. Now, um, what happens to Tom when Tom is not being observed? Um, and I'm especially interested not from the as it were theorists' standpoint, but from the kids' standpoint, right? Um, so is the question uh, about whether they, how come they're not confused about the ontological status of Tom? Um, well, their, their mind take care of, takes care of this. <laughs> By by giving them from the beginning, this the possibility of of generating uh, mental tokens that um, um, whose um, so where nothing depends on their existence in the world. Now it's too. It's a good question. How they deal with the distinction between what exists and what does not. I. Um, I, I don't know. All right, thanks so much. Um, I was just, you know, um, wondering if there still isn't any conundrum. <laughs> Maybe there's a bit of a conundrum there. Yeah. Anyway. No, no. The, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, no, the, the, uh, there is one. I <clears throat> I just thought you were, you you, know, you were asking a, a different question, namely where do these mental representations get their content? I thought that was the conundrum because that's- what... Oh, I see, okay, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, um, and that's a traditional question. I, yeah, I, I wasn't asking that, but, but it, I could see how that, that would immediately spring to mind given, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, my, my and, no, 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 not at all. I think, I think uh, you were, you were spot on. So um, uh, oftentimes um, in this kind of causal approach, people would tend to think that uh, uh, discourse reference in some sense, uh, uh, wear their uh, actual counterparts on their sleeve or something like that. All right, I wonder if there are um, other questions and I see a hand from Steff. Steff, your second question, it's all yours. Yes, it's uh, partly for you and partly for Barbu. So for you, it's like this. Uh, if you are the kid you in your story and you see Tom, do you think that it will be any difference between Tom on the screen and Tom the cat in your kitchen? This is for you. 
And for Barbu, if a kid has the same representation, the same token, you said, mental token, which is very nice. If he used, he or she he used the same mental token for something on the screen and something in reality, how can be possible? And also in your experiments, adults did the same thing. They use the same representation for a toy and for a real, for the representation of a real train, let's say that, a, a, a toy representing a train, it was somehow confusing with the, with the real train. But they are acknowledged that the fact that one is a toy and one, another one is representing a real thing. So if you, we, if we as adults, we know that there is a material world, spatial temporal, as you said, and another one. Why do you use the same mental token, mental representation for both of them? All right, thanks so much for the question, Steph. Um, Babu, if you'd like to, to uh, provide an answer. I was just thinking, um, just very quickly, I was, um, yes. uh, apologies. I was just thinking that uh, uh, so something uh, Steph said reminded me of Disney World, right? So you, you go and meet Mickey Mouse in person, right? And like a lot of, a lot of kids are bound to be confused by that, right? Um, but I, I don't know, maybe this is, this is uh, uh, off topic. So uh, apologies, please go ahead. So I don't, I don't think they would be confused by that necessarily. Uh, I mean, there are, after, after every, any Disney movie, there are toys which are launched, plush toys, which stand for the characters in, in the Disney movie. Now, the discourse referent is the same. It's just that the symbols that can stand for it are multiple. Um, right, it's Woody from Toy Story, but it's on the screen, it, there's someone dressed as Woody from Toy Story in Disneyland. And there's also this plush toy that I have in my hand. Um, just like there could be multiple drawings of you, of me. And um, uh, so um, I think that's mm, not a, a, a problem. I didn't, uh, Steph, I didn't understand what you meant when you said that, um, Adults confuse real trains for toy trains. Um, no, obviously they are not confusing. They yeah, are, yeah, they are yes. so, but they are using your experiments prove that they are using the same concept as a representation, the same mental token as the representation, as a mental representation for the object. It's so, the same. It's not the same. Object token. reference. Object reference. You, you, you have used uh, uh, many, uh, many words, as I understood, describing quite the same thing. It doesn't matter what the, the same concept, but uh, Andre will uh, ask us what is a concept and uh, how, based on which theory, theory we'll define the concept. But let's put it simple, the same concept. We use the same concept when perceiving a toy, a train toy and a picture of a real train. Train, yes. So they are both pictures. First of all, they are clusters of pixels. For a machine, for a Python program, it was not no no difference. Okay, clusters of pixels. Yes. But yes. one of them looks like a real one, and another one obviously as a toy. But it was a difference in your experiment in perceiving their, their dimensions because it is this assumption that we compare the real things in our heads, okay? Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's right, it's right, I got it right. So if we yeah. compare the real things, is not strange. Why do we, com do we compare a toy with a real thing? Something that does not exist with something that exists in the in the uh, material world, let's say. So why it's so, so for a for a dog, 
the smell of another dog is unique. It has no other representation, probably. It's the smell of the other dog. It's the sign of that dog, or my uh, uh, smell, let's say, as the master of the dogs for in, in his world. He has no other representation. We have representation of things. We invent Tom on the screen. We draw some lines. We make it in your experiment. You put uh, you put uh, you you you, you uh, use the very childish uh, drawing to represent a human. Anyone can recognize it, even a uh, uh, very very small small kid. Why? Because it is linked to a concept. Okay. It is a representation of something. But how can we make this kind of mistake to to assign the same concept? to the things in the real world with the things in our mental world or imaginative world. We're not stupid, but we use the same concept. Why we do that? All right, thanks so much for your question. Thank Shai. you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm not sure it's a mistake if, if, um, um, if what I have said is is um, on on the, more or less on the right track, so if we use objects, manipulable props to represent things that we care about, like the YouTube sh uh, chef using his dog as as a symbol for for a cow, there was no mis there's no mistake there. Nobody makes them. Everybody understands that the dog just stands for a cow now for this episode and this particular purpose that uh, we had in mind. Um, but we are interested in cows or maybe interested in cows at, at that point. And uh, it's, use, it's a useful way, it's an efficient way of transferring information between among us. How it would be so much more difficult to explain where the beef loin is with language uh, than um, and like this, so um, so I don't think these are mistakes because at no point is the identity relation or kind membership relation predicated on this uh, object on the symbol object. So a toy train is not a train, but you can stand for a train, which is a different type of predicate. No, it's not a mistake. Of course, it's it's a versatility. But this is the question in a cognitive science field. How can it be possible if we, let's say, we imagine that we are the same with mammals, but with something more? Or this, uh, it is, I think it's a uniqueness of the human being to use the concept. You, you said about Python. Okay, a machine using Python will instantiate a class, but not the way, the, the other way, uh, the other way, okay? So an, an object will not become a class. Only a class can become an object in programming languages, okay? But not vice versa. But for human it's possible. Fodor, uh, we, 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 uh, we talked about Fodor today. And he said- and Great it's guy. In, it's interesting, yes. It's interesting that uh, the concepts are built by induction. So we, we've seen a lot of, a lot of uh, instances of objects and we associate them with, with concepts. Yes, maybe it's possible like this also. So the, yeah, the, main, the, the, the main idea is that we can use these classes, concepts to instantiate things. And also we get Empirically, we get concepts from the reality. It's very, it's very interesting, I think. And your experiments are very, very close to, to this, uh, this idea that uh, bothers me a lot of concept and real representation of, of uh, it's, it's very nice, I think. That's uh, all the questions. <laughs> I try to provoke you to, to, to say more. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> at any time. All right, thanks so much, Steph. And um, 
Uh, I see Catalin has been waiting for a while, but uh, Catalin, with your permission, before I give you the floor, uh, I thought that there might be some way uh, that could uh, follow up on what uh, Steph was saying. So just to share how I understood uh, part of his question. Babu, you had a slide early on uh, where you had um, um, the head of a person and then you had those, uh, um, uh, the discourse reference and the concepts and the uh, symbols and there were some arrows, right? running um, uh, 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 each, uh, well, not each direction, but uh, there were uh, some arrows running uh, from the symbols to the discourse reference, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and thought was, uh, sure, there's an assignment function there, but uh, how is that going to be constrained if in any way, right? So are there any principled constraints on that or uh, we're just going to assign it and that's it? constrained meaning um so there are two two questions here i guess one is when are we going to use this when are we going to treat an object as a symbol so that we can do this assignment and second what 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 the uh what's the identity of the discourse referent that will so is it a cat is it an animal that is stand for uh, the mm, complete void of living in a pandemic or uh, yeah um so uh, which one did you have in mind or did you have a third? Well, I guess I was just, um, um, well, I wasn't wondering with respect to what gets to count as a symbol because with enough ingenu uh, with, with enough imagination, I guess um, anything can, can get to count as a symbol for uh, uh, yeah. uh, somebody who's playful enough. Um, but I guess I was wondering whether um, um, the relationship of uh, the, the assignment function that went top uh, from the top level to the middle level and the labeling function that went from concepts that was the bottom level to the middle level of discourse reference, whether there was any, there was meant to be any connection between them so that this toy train gets to stand in for a real train because they sort of look alike yeah. or because, uh, yes. yeah. And um, if so, there seems to be, it's not just that any assignment of, of a value to a free variable works, but rather the one that somehow reminds us of it or something like that. Yes, it's a, uh, it's a great question. Um, so, uh, surely there are at least two ways in which uh, we can do that. I can just describe them. It's not an explanation, but of course, iconicity is a very good cue to what an object is supposed to stand for. So if it looks like, if it's a tra if it's a drawing that looks like a pipe, then it pro probably is supposed to stand for a pipe. Uh, we, I mean, we just saw that toys are more ambiguous and there you have to, you are more, <clears throat> although even there, the hypothesis space is quite restricted by how the object looks like because it looks like a train, but it also looks like a toy. So, um, um, so uh, again, it's, it's, uh, you get the uh, restriction of the hypothesis space by iconic features, but you also get, uh, so you also need additional information or you can give different weightings to this hypothesis depending on what surrounds the, and, um, even more strikingly, uh, like a triangle. This is, a, we use triangles and circles conventionally to denote um, many things. So there the hypothesis space is larger. You need the visual context to know if it's a traffic sign or if it's a mountain on a map or um, so on. Um, and so I think the iconicity is one way to derive it. I, I It's a very difficult uh, question and it, uh, we, arrive to the frame problem probably um uh so i i, I suggest we don't go there um and stipulation direct, direct stipulation is, is is another uh, option so when you say this stands this, now this is a, this pillow is my horse now this, this now this dog uh, so if you look at the cow from here and 
uh, so with language you can um, just in you can, you're positing, yeah. Yeah, you're you're positing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're stipulating. Yeah. Um, and then there's also there's not only so you don't have just the way it looks like, but also the way it behaves. So in the Hyder and Zimmel like animation, you have triangles or circles moving in a self-propelled way, which is a very good cue to agency, which suggests that those are probably agents, stand for agents. Right. Right. Okay, well, thanks so much. Um, um, lots of lots of puzzlement there. So, yeah, uh, Katalin has been waiting for a while. Katalin, uh, uh, if you'd like to ask your question now. Uh, thank you, Andre. So, uh, Barbu, you had indeed a very nice slide with where you presented the architecture. So, if you can put it again, the one with the triangles, uh, because I want to ask a question about uh, that. Yes, just just a sec. Um, yeah, this part. Uh, so uh, the question regards the first experiment, I think it was, and we observed there that there is a, a strip effect when we use small uh, symbol objects because of the difference with the big uh, objects. Can you explain how based on this architecture, I mean, what happens that this troop effect uh, appears? How things are happening in this architecture? And then actually the following question is, uh, what would be maybe the best second option to explain the troop effect that is not maybe based on this architecture? Um, so, So yeah, here's how it starts. You have two images on the screen and those are picked up by the by an object indexing system which um, sees them and now is able to track them because it has pointers that uh, that uh, point to that point to them. So they give you the object one at location x, y, z and object two location x prime, y prime, z prime. Okay, so that's, this is, can you see my cursor? Mm -hmm. This is this part. Now, um, uh, why why do we talk about um, this course reference? I mean, that was the question of the experiment. Do adults interpret these image, images in a symbolic uh, in a symbolic manner? Or do they take them to be stand-ins for for other things? And that's why we used toy object, right? Because of this uh, contrast. Toy objects are small, but uh, the objects that they stand for are, are not are large. Um, so when they see a fountain and the and the toy train, uh, because of how these um, objects look like, um, there is this uh, um, second and third step happening. Uh, at, at the same time, this discourse reference are individuated. I mean, our, our label get get a label based on the available visual evidence. Um, can you? Yeah. So, um, I, I hope that answers the, the the first question that you asked. The second question was whether there's any. No, no, so other... hold on, even to the first question because uh, it maybe it has uh, answers, but just to be clear, so the delay is because we need to run all these three layers, basically, right? Or, no, no. But where no, the... where then the delay comes from? Okay, um, let me. Go back to because the delay it means that I will need to basically my brain needs to do something more, right? I, I believe, or something more yes, complicated yes, yes, or something, yes. right? Yeah. So where this yeah, happens, yeah. yeah. So in under any story, the del, there's a delay because so there's a delay, there's a relative delay, right? Between um this image and this image so this image takes longer than this image that's a, that's mm -hmm. the delay mm -hmm. i mean of course it takes 500 milliseconds to do any type of but 
relative, there's a relative delay in one set of images compared to the other, right? Mm -hmm. So the delay comes in, uh, in uh, regardless of which story you take, uh, because there's an in interference between the symbols. So the symbols here being the images and uh, here the image on the left is larger than the one on the right which is congruent with the real size difference of the object in the world because horses are larger than clocks. Okay. So um, here you wouldn't have this, see, so horse is larger than clock, but image of horse is smaller than clock. And you have to make a size, uh, you have to take a, make a size decision and because these um, these relations are in opposite directions, that is what is causing the delay. So if you can now go back to the architecture, so, and because now examples are very clear, if you can go back and take the first example and maybe show with the cursor how this moves. And then the second, because I'm curious to understand still what happens differently in this architecture that there is a difference in the, uh, uh, how fast yeah, I'm answering, yeah. yeah. So just very quickly, if I may interject something, 30 seconds to make sure I've understood uh, the question. So uh, Katalin, was it uh, something like this in point of physical symbols? Uh, you see that the represented horse is smaller than the represented clock, but in point of concepts, you have this conceptual knowledge from the get-go that horses are bigger than clocks. And so at the discourse uh, level, there's going to be some kind of a contradiction or mismatch and that's what's supposed to cause the delay. Is that the thought? And so I guess, I wonder if that's- yeah, this is the, Yeah, this is what I'm trying to, to understand. Is this between discourse and concepts or where is the gap coming from? Okay. Here, I mean, he, he, here, there, there is, I, uh, on this slide where the, uh, where there is this overview, there's, uh, there's nothing that would predict the interference, but we know the interference exists from, from the literature. And so that we, we, we take for granted, but anyway, if, if, I mean, it's here, right? So these objects, one of them is larger than the other, but here the relation is reversed. And when you access the object, you have these pointers, that send you to this layer, and then the, the, there the relation is has the opposite uh, opposite uh, direction. Okay, now it's clear. So then the second question was, uh, if there is still time to ask it, is is there any others or what is the best second option to explain this delay, uh, Barbu? Because this is uh, a nice theory, right? But I'm sure that you thought of other maybe possibilities, and then you chose this one. So what is the best competing? Uh, uh, theory to explain the, the delay? Um, so the original explanation and the, ori the explanation of Stroop, of the original Stroop effect, the one with the colors uh, goes uh, in a similar direction. There are two levels of representation and there's an interference because one level sends you in one direction and then another level sends you in a different direction. So that's, that they, th th this is in common with the original author's paper uh, explanation as I mean, they don't explain why the stroke effect arises. They care about whether size is computed automatically in, uh, in vision. There is an explanation that, uh, uh, my, that Gabo who is here on the left would, uh, favor. And it's, um, it's speculative at this point, but the mm, idea is that it's, uh, it arises because of perceived communicative inefficiency. So, um, the possi the, so there's a possibility that <clears throat> there's no interference of this kind happening here. Just this message that I get is incongruent, is inefficient. Why do you show me this when you, when you could have shown me the good option? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your reasoning over alternative messages, namely you correct the, I mean, you correct the display in your, in your mind by making the horse larger and the clock smaller. And that's what caused the delay. 
clear. Thank you very much, Bargu. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I'm especially grateful to uh, Bargu naturally for the talk and to Stefan and Katalin for so many uh, interesting questions. Um, I very much hope that uh, if you guys will want to keep in touch and ask Bargu some more questions, um, uh, his uh, uh, email is uh, readily available and uh, maybe you can uh, share them online. I, I fear we've already uh, grilled him for an hour and a half and that's, that's excessive by the standards of, of many uh, talks. Um, uh, Bagbu, we're very grateful for uh, having you here tonight and we very much hope you'll uh, join us uh, many times in the future as well. So thanks once again and um, have a good night, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.